So to follow up with uh, a demo from what Jimmy and Timmy showed us earlier from Google uh, is Mandy from Google. So please give her a round of applause. Hi everyone, how you doing? Great to be here, it's really wonderful. <laughs> Weather's gorgeous, bunch of smart people in the room, so I'm gonna really follow up on what Jimmy and uh, David presented earlier. We're gonna talk about Google Compute Engine. And one of the reasons we're here, obviously, is because we now support uh, Debian. And we have Wheezy and Squeeze. So, Compute Engine, now with Wheezy and Squeeze. My name is Mandy Waite. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. And if you want to find out more about me, about.me slash Mandy Waite. So, we're going to spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about Compute Engine, a bit deeper dive than uh, Jimmy and David uh, uh, gave you. But... We're also going to talk about customizing virtual machines, then we're going to have an interactive demo, which should be a bit of fun, hopefully. We'll get to that in, uh, very soon, about my feelings about doing interactive demos. Right, okay, introduction to Compute Engine. So Compute Engine is part of the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and the Google Cloud Platform is basically broken up into three main areas. Uh, we have compute, we have storage, and we have services. Uh, in the compute side, we have uh, Compute Engine, which is an infrastructure as a service offering. And we're going to talk about that, that's the, the entire subject of this talk. Then we have App Engine. App Engine is a platform as a service offering. And you, this slide, who, who was at uh, Jimmy and David's talk? So we've already seen something similar to this already. Okay, so I'm just a little bit deeper, just covering some of the same things that they did, but I want to provide context for those who weren't here. So App Engine is a platform as a service offering. And basically what that does is provide you with an entire software stack. So you build your applications on top of that software stack. And <coughs> the software, tax, software stacks are what we call runtimes. And we have runtimes for Java, we have runtimes for Python, runtimes for the Go programming language, and one for Python as well, uh, PHP. And I was having a conversation today about PHP, and probably not a good idea to make PHP available to more people in the world. So my PHP, my PHP must die t-shirt is in the post. So where Compute Engine provides you, uh, or removes the need for you to worry about actually building and maintaining uh, servers, uh, uh, App Engine actually provides you with a software stack so you don't have to worry about building software stacks, buying and licensing software. <coughs> And what that does is that frees you up to actually develop your application code, develop your business logic, and not actually worry about installing software stacks. On the storage side, we have Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud Storage, which is an object store. Uh, this is used for storing files, uh, unstructured data, any type of file, data files, uh, executables, images, blobs, that kind of thing. Uh, pretty much any type of file and pretty much any size. Google Cloud SQL is our uh, relational offering. So think MySQL in the cloud. And Cloud Data Store is our NoSQL, our massively scalable NoSQL uh, service that we use internally, which is built on top of uh, Megastore and Bigtable, <coughs> and which used to be tied exclusively to App Engine, but recently we, we freed it up from uh, its reliance upon App Engine, and it's now available from pretty much anywhere via an API. On the services side, we have Google BigQuery, and so there's probably going to be some bits missing because the boxes aren't showing up, so uh, hopefully that's going to be reasonably clear. Uh, Google BigQuery allows you to run interactive analysis across massive data sets. Uh, and we're talking about interactive here, so you can type in a query, get results back very quickly. Uh, I mean, the data sets we're talking about are the size in petabytes, terabytes, billions of rows of data. Uh, uses an SQL-like syntax, so it's very simple to use, very familiar to most people who've used SQL before. But it allows you to get results back in seconds and not minutes or hours, uh, like you would do with, say, a MapReduce. We have Google Cloud Endpoints, which is our entry point into the cloud. This is implemented on App Engine, uh, but it pretty much, if you're using App Engine, you can use Cloud Endpoints to access any, any part of our cloud. Uh, this allows you to write your application logic, your business logic, and expose that as an API. And the APIs look very, very similar to the APIs that we offer. Uh, they're discoverable, and you can build client libraries from those APIs. Uh, for Android, for iOS, and for the web. Caching, we have caching services pretty much everywhere, so we cache at the edge, uh, we have memcache implementations. And queues, we have task queues that allow you to 
join App Engine and Compute Engine together so you can actually uh, move your workloads to where they're most appropriate. And we have a lot more. And of course, the whole thing about this is it runs on Google infrastructure. This is the same software and hardware infrastructure that we use to service your search queries and also to run YouTube and Gmail, those kind of services. So Google Compute Engine, very quick look at this. Uh, we're going to be talking about virtual machines, about networks and firewalls, about storage resources and disks, and about the tooling that you can use uh, to actually manage all of those compute resources, uh, and the API that you can use to actually build your own applications around those compute, res compute resources. A quick uh, overview of the Compute Engine architecture. Uh, Basically, main, four main areas, virtual machines, networking, storage, and the API and tools. Uh, this doesn't have cloud, uh, cloud load balancing. Uh, you may have seen, if you saw this slide earlier from Jimmy's talk, uh, it actually had load balancing as a component. But we were kind of, we released it last week, and it was kind of touch and go as to whether it would be released, and I kind of changed my slides, I removed that. Ended up with no load balancing, and then really couldn't be bothered to put it back again. But we do have load balancing. So let's uh, go a little bit deeper into each one of those sections. So virtual machines, we have Linux virtual machines. So we obviously have Debian, uh, that's why we're here. We have Squeeze and, we <laughs> Squeeze and Wheezy. And we also support CentOS, but we're not here to talk about CentOS. So. Uh, we have many virtual machine hardware configurations, basically combinations of uh, memory, CPU, and disk. So you can build pretty much whatever you want to in terms of the hardware configuration. We also have uh, fractional virtual machines, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, small and micro virtual machines. And these are uh, shared core instances. Uh, so they're for workloads that don't really require huge amounts of uh, processing power. We have, root, we have root access, effective root access to all of your virtual machines. And we recently introduced sub-hour billing. So uh, you pay for the first 10 minutes. You always pay for 10 minutes of your instance uptime. But then we build by the minute from that point onwards. So if you use it for five minutes, you'll pay for 10 minutes. If you use it for two hours, you'll pay for two hours. In terms of network resources, well, virtual machines, they don't live in isolation. They need to talk to each other. They need to talk to the internet. So uh, all of the virtual machines within a project uh, are linked via a private network. And you can build your own private networks. Uh, you can use network resources and firewall resources to create rules that determine how the virtual machines will interact with each other and with the internet. Uh, advanced routing allows you to build advanced networking configurations uh, that allows you to implement things like virtual, uh, virtual private networking. <laughs> Recently, we introduced uh, layer free load balancing. As I said, that was announced last week and removed from the slides, unfortunately. Uh, that allows you to load balance all of your HTTP traffic or other traffic across multiple virtual machines or virtual machine endpoints. Uh, it also supports health checking to make sure that uh, traffic is only routed to, routed or routed, depending on where you come from, uh, to instances that are up and healthy. And it's effectively a cloud native implementation. And by, what I mean by that is that it's implemented as part of our network infrastructure. It's not kind of bolted on. It doesn't need a, a, an instance to run on. And please do stop me if you have any questions as well. So virtual machines need disks. They need to be able to boot. Uh, they need to have places where they can store data uh, temporarily or permanently. So the two offerings we have in terms of disks for uh, the virtual machines are persistent disk and scratch disk. Uh, persistent disks uh, live in the cloud. They're virtual, they're virtual machine independent. Uh, and some people were concerned about how you would use a, that type of disk to actually boot a virtual machine. But our experience so far and feedback from people we, we've been working with, people, companies like MAPAR, have fed back that the persistent disk is as quick to boot as uh, other offerings, other scratch offerings from other, uh, other cloud vendors. So you don't have to worry about persistent disk being slow to boot. Uh, also, these uh, persistent disks are shareable. They can be attached and detached from virtual machines, and they can be shared between virtual machines. Uh, <coughs> you can actually share them between a group of virtual machines in read-only mode. So if you have a bunch of data on a disk that you want to share between multiple machines, you can do that in read-only mode. 
We also support snapshots, so you can make snapshots of a, a disk state at a particular time, and then you can use that snapshot to actually create uh, new persistent disks. Um, and again, snapshots are project-level resources. They're not instance-level resources. They live in the cloud, and you can use them with anywhere within a project. The scratch disk, what we used to call ephemeral disk, uh, is effectively a local disk, local to the virtual machine. It's tied to the life cycle of the virtual machine, lives and dies with it. So it's basically for temporary data. Uh, you boot the machine from it, store data on it temporarily. Once the virtual machine goes away, that disk will go away. But you can use it, you can, you can add scratch disks to your machines. Uh, you need more disk space for a temporary, uh, temporary result. So, and during the demo, we're actually going to look at uh, how we can create a scratch disk. I've already mentioned the other cloud platform storage options, uh, cloud storage, cloud SQL, and cloud data store. So we, we pretty much have everything covered in that respect. The API and the tools, so all of our tools, all of our uh, tools that we provide, uh, the tools that uh, Jimmy and uh, David demoed to you, uh, things like GCUtil and the user interface, they all work via our API. And our API is uh, JSON over HTTP, pretty standard, uh, a RESTful uh, API. The main resources, uh, the nouns, are the compute resources that we mentioned so far, projects, instances, networks, firewalls, disks, snapshots, and so on. The actions, the verbs, are standard HTTP uh, verbs. Get, post, uh, post is used for create, delete, and we have custom verbs for updates. And really a combination of put and post for different, uh, different functions. All of the authentication for the API is done via OAuth2, but we also have service accounts, which I'll mention later. Right, so, next thing, how many people before this talk had actually heard of Compute Engine? <laughs> okay, so D David had. So, like, <laughs> a few of you. How many people have actually used, had hands-on on Compute Engine? Uh, only one person. <laughs> David again. You should work for Google. You do work for Google. So if you want to have Compute Engine, uh, it's in open preview now. It's, that was announced at Google I.O. back in May. So you can sign up for it now. Paid support is available, four levels of support. Uh, we have an SLA for all of the customers that use it. And you can get started at that particular URL. And the important things you need to remember from that URL are cloud and compute. But if you go to cloud.google.com, you're probably going to get there anyway. And the kitten, the kitten wants Compute Engine. Before, when it was in limited preview, the kitten couldn't have Compute Engine, but now it can. You guys don't care about kittens, though, do you, really? Wrong audience for kittens. So custom, uh, customization options. So a virtual machine, the, the, the image of a virtual machine, uh, getting a, a Debian image and installing it on your instance, it probably isn't really going to be enough for you. Uh, you're not going to want to run a, a pure vanilla uh, OS image. So you're going to want to customize the image. You're going to want to install software on it. You're going to want to run services on it and provide configuration. Uh, install packages, uh, install custom software from uh, various sources. And we're going to show an example of that later. Uh, so one way, <coughs> the first way uh, to, to customize your image is to take a Google-provided OS image and to customize it and put that back into the cloud, put it back into Compute Engine so it's accessible for you whenever you provision new instances. And we'll go through that process in a second. Also, you can use startup scripts uh, to dynamically configure your instances. So it may well be that you have... Uh, <coughs> a base build and a base setup, but you have uh, startup scripts for various different use cases, for various different purposes. And the startup scripts are kind of similar to rc.local, that they install software at, uh, at boot time. You can combine the first two options. So you can have uh, a broad uh, base image that you use, or multiple base images that you use for multiple machines and multiple VMs. Uh, and you can then customize those individually for groups of VMs or for specific, specific VMs using startup scripts. And the final way is to, use, to build your own images using Build Debian Cloud, which used to be called EC2 Debian Build AMI. Am I allowed to say AMI or do I have to say AMI? All right, okay. I like spelling, I, I never know whether to spell things out or not. Like SQL, SQL is to me, I can't say SQL. Uh, 
Well, when I, when, I used to work at Sun, we were, when I used to work at Sun, we were slapped around for saying SQL because it was just not done. So uh, EC2, EC2 Debian build AMI, and that now supports both Amazon EC2 and Compute Engine Images, and, and uh, Jimmy mentioned it uh, during his talk. So currently, the versions we have of Debian, uh, the stock images that we have when you uh, install Compute Engine, when you want to provision instances, are Squeeze 6.07 and Wheezy 7.1. I did have CentOS on this slide, but I thought it might offend you all, so I removed it. So creating custom images. Uh, I was going to walk through this, but I feel I'd like to spend more time uh, doing the interactive demo. So custom image, basically what you have to do is create a new instance and you have to provide it with a service account, or you have to tell it to use a service account. Now, the service account basically does authentication for you. Uh, normally, the authentication flow we use is OAuth. So if from a computing engine instance you wanted to access another service or another API, you would have to authenticate against it, and you would have to go through an OAuth flow. But in this case, you can provide a service account, which actually stores a, a refresh token in its metadata, and it will handle all of the authentication for you. So in this case, when we create a new instance, we're saying create a service account, give it the access storage for, which means it has access to uh, uh, Google Cloud Storage, can do reads and writes, and we're going to use Cloud Storage for storing our image. Then you SSH into the instance and customize the image setup. So in this case, you'll, you'll install custom software, uh, add packages, do configuration, start services, that kind of thing. And uh, then you're going to create an image tarball using imagebundle.py, a Python script that we supply, and that will create a large image for you. Uh, will take some time to run, depending on the level of configuration that you've, uh, you've made on the image. And then once you've done that, upload the image tarball to Google Cloud Storage, where it's accessible for you to use with GCUtil, one of the tools that uh, Jimmy showed you earlier. Uh, to add the image back into Compute Engine. It now becomes a project-level resource for you to use within, all of your, proje within your particular project. Uh, projects are basically the housing of all of the resources that you create. So when you create virtual machines and networks and such like, you do them at the project level, and they're kind of isolated. You can't share these resources between projects. And then once you've done that, the image should now be added uh, to the list of images that are available for you to build instances with. And you can do GCU to list images uh, to see the images that you have. And it should be there. And we'll, we'll have a look at that in the demo. Instance metadata. <coughs> so virtual machines need to know stuff about their environment. They need to have some context in which they're running in. Uh, so the metadata server provides that to the instance. It's basically a, a, a dictionary of key value pairs. It has some basic information pushed into it at, at provision time. Things like the host name, the image, the zone, that kind of thing. But you can also use custom metadata, and that's set by the API. But all this stuff is read by the instance specifically, so it gives the instance context about its environment. <coughs> it's accessible via the, the instance metadata server, so you just run HTTP code on metadata uh, using curl or something like that to get information from it. And it's useful for very small amounts of config data. You can push startup scripts into uh, uh, the metadata server, but less than, only less than 32K. There's also project level metadata, which is accessible to all instances. So you can actually set metadata at the project level, and that will be propagated to all of the instances that you create. A very, very brief example. So we set an environment variable, MDS, uh, and just use curl to access the uh, metadata role and config value, get those values back. And also, because you may, your software may be running on some unknown cloud, and you might want to know what cloud it's running on. In order to find out if you're running on Compute Engine, you can just ping metadata.google.internal, and that will, if that comes back with a positive response, then you know you're running on Compute Engine. So you can obviously code that. You don't need to use ping. You can use some kind of IP ping or something like that. And startup scripts, so the whole point of talking about metadata was because startup scripts exist within metadata. Uh, they're provided, provisioned by the uh, metadata server at provision time. And they're very similar to rc.local, they run at boot time. Uh, if you reboot the virtual machine, which it is possible to do, uh, although you probably wouldn't do it, you're more likely to delete the image, and, uh, delete the instance and then uh, create a new one. But if you reboot it, it will run again. Example usage is to install packages and to start services, but you can also bootstrap other compute resources. So in the two examples here, uh, a startup script is used, <coughs> is created, 
and then it's pushed into the uh, metadata at the instance creation time. So that start, startup script, startup script, startup.sh will live in the metadata for that particular instance. Sorry? <laughs> okay. Right, so now we're going to go into an interactive demo. So, now interactive demos are normally places where you have a room full of corner cases. Uh, so, corner cases are when your demos go wrong, and normally everybody in the room is a cor corner case. It always breaks, it's always going to break, and hopefully it w won't break so much. <coughs> so, let's go through this. What we're going to do, if you want to follow along, if you have a laptop, and so few of you have laptops. <laughs> uh, but if you want to follow along, I'm going to do this myself, but you're perfectly welcome to follow along. We're going to look for the most unusual objects in the universe. Okay? We're going to look for weird galaxies and novas and that kind of thing. And so we're going to be used in software that's going to be used with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is about to be built in Chile, on a mountain somewhere in Chile. And the plan is that the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope will image half of the sky, the southern hemisphere, every three days or so. Over the course of 10 years, it's going to gather 60 petabytes worth of data, and it's going to image 10 billion discrete stars and 10 billion discrete galaxies. And the software we're going to use is part of a concerted effort to actually build highly scalable astronomical analysis tools. The camera used with the LSST is a 3.2 gigapixel camera. I want one of those on my phone, because <laughs> would I can match the size of the files? I mean, it's like 20 terabytes a day this project will, will generate, which is like crazy. And so what we're going to do, we have a thousands of images uh, we can pull from. Uh, these ones were taken by other cameras, obviously the telescope's not been built yet. But what we can do is we can take images from a particular area, and in this case they focus on galaxies, where particular galaxies where, where we have images for, and we can take individual images and we can overlay them. And then we can align them to make sure they're aligned for the correct coordinates. And then we can build a very deep image of that particular area of the sky. So it may be focused on a particular galaxy or some other interesting object. But we'll get a very deep view of the sky. And all of the, all of the objects that are in that particular frame or in that particular area will stand out very clearly, as you can see in the second image, which is basically a composite of the first three or four there. So the prerequisites to make sure you have the following installed, you need a browser, and you'll need to have local storage enabled and JavaScript enabled. And you'll also need a terminal and SSH. So you guys being uh, Debian hackers, you're going to have access to SSH. And IceWeasel is a great browser and it should work perfectly. Jimmy's tried it and it does work perfectly. One thing you may get, you may actually download the slides, because you're going to get a copy of the slides when you run this. You may actually download them rather than actually view them in line. <coughs> Quick word about GCUtil. Jimmy and David demonstrated the GCUtil tool earlier. This is basically the Compute Engine Power tool. Uh, it allows you to access all aspects of Compute Engine, apart from maybe some of the metadata, uh, like who has access to the project, that kind of thing, project level resources. Uh, it allows you to create virtual machines, networks, uh, instances, uh, disks, uh, pretty much everything you can do within Compute Engine. And I've been trying to find out, figure out where to put this slide because I wanted to introduce you to Util first, but it might be more helpful for you to have a look at it later when you're actually logged into a virtual machine. So provisioning and managing virtual machines. So for this demo, we're going to need some virtual machines that you can work with. Uh, there's lots of third-party tools that are available to provision instances, things like RightScale, Scalar, uh, Puppet, Chef. Uh, they can all be used for provision instances, uh, dynamically provision them based on workloads. Uh, but you can also use a script, and this would just invoke GCUtil to add and delete virtual machines. And what we're using here is a script we created for this particular demo called cl.sh, and I was going to run it in, uh, live, but it would probably take too long, so I decided not to. But that's what you'll see. We'll run the script, and it will create 50 to 60 instances for us. It takes four or five minutes to create that many instances. OK, so how many of you want to follow along? OK, so 
The first thing you need to do is go to gce-debian-demo.appspot.com in your browser. And appspot.com is the uh, domain for app, uh, app Engine applications. Uh, if you don't have an, uh, a Google Apps domain, that's where your uh, app will live. So anytime you create an App Engine application, it will uh, have a, a .appspot.com domain. So from the drop down, you see when you go to that website, select DebConf 2013 GCE Interactive Demo. And then enter your name and click the Start button. Yeah? No, you don't need to have GC until. So basically, the idea of this, but of this uh, demo is to give you access to an instance that you can use. Uh, so we want to just give you a quick, simple SSH, in, uh, SSH access to the, to the virtual machine. Local storage is required. Isn't it? The script pushes the token into the local storage. So, sure, yeah. Anybody following along had any luck? Yeah, you get a PDF, so that's, that's the, uh, the rest of the slides, uh, so you can reference them locally. You can, once you have the slides, you can follow along at your own pace, or you can just wait for me and, and follow along with me. How's it going, Jimmy? Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. So. Once you're there, you'll find you have a copy of the slides. You'll either get them viewed in, uh, displayed in line or you'll get them, them downloaded as a PDF file. And at the top of the bar on that URL, there's a link to participant info. If you click on that, it will give you some information about the actual virtual machine. So that will give you information, and I'll do it myself. That gives you information about the virtual machine. So the username, <laughs> very, very small. Uh, username and password, external IP address, and an SSH uh, connection that you can use to SSH into the, into the instance. No? No luck? OK. So the participant info uh, is there really just so you can SSH into the machine really easily. Uh, and I'm just going to do that here. Yep, you can follow that. Yeah, I'll get back to it. So that's what everybody wanted to see. So if you want to SSH into the machine, just basically copy and paste the uh, last line there, uh, GC Code Lab, whatever version you have. Oh, it's the one you click on participant info. You need to click on participant info to get your individual So up here, participant info. Yeah, you got it? <laughs> and 
Anybody struggling to find the participant info? Did you find it? Was that sorry? Yes, I have to connect. Uh, okay, excellent. So, how many of you logged into your instance? Okay, all right, brilliant. So the next thing we're going to do is, hello, come on, load. I think the network seems to be struggling. So. Hopefully your connectivity to your virtual machine will stay up and running, but the next thing to do is to actually add a scratch disk to your assigned virtual machine. In the home directory of the user that you logged in as, you'll find there's two scripts, uh, one called addscratch.sh and one called gettile.sh. Now they're basically there just for simplicity, just to simplify the process. You should be able to cut and paste the information in the slides, the copy of the slides that you have, to actually create the disk and just set the uh, permissions on the disk. But if not, just run the add script, uh, twiddle slash add underscore scratch dot sh. And that will create a new scratch disk for you. What we talked about earlier, we mentioned we have persistent disk and we have scratch disk. This will create a new scratch disk for you. As I say, if you get stuck, just run the script. Anybody looking at those slides? Because you have a copy of this information is on the slides that you have, that, uh, that you downloaded, or that you uh, displayed in line. Yeah. The shortcut is the easiest way to do it. Yeah, so cutting and pasting from the PDF files is really difficult. It tends to remove uh, hyphens and such like. So I'm just basically running that now. So if you type in DF minus H, you'll see that you have quite a large about amount of scratch disk available to you. Uh, it's mounted on slash MNT slash scratch zero, and it's about 1.8 terabytes in size. And again, this type, the size of scratch disks available to you depends on the size of the instance that you're using. So the next step is to actually assign yourself part of the universe. And to do this, uh, you're going to pull down something from our servers, from, uh, from actually from Google Cloud Storage, uh, by connecting to a URL on another App Engine application uh, con called computecodelab.appspot.com. And what that's going to do is connect with Google Cloud Storage and pull down a bunch of uh, image URLs for you and some metadata. Uh, and once you've done that, you need to copy some files using GSUtil, again, something at all that's... Uh, uh, Jimmy mentioned in his talk, GSUtil allows you to interact with Google Cloud Storage. Uh, so both of those steps are actually using Google Cloud Storage. One to pull down this, uh, th this URL of files, and one to uh, get the uh, files you need necessarily to actually run the next step. And again, there's a shortcut at the bottom there, twiddle slash get tile dot sh. Twiddle get underscore tile dot sh. And you can run that, and that will give you the tile assignment. I'm going to do the same thing here. <coughs> and obviously, we don't care about the Wi-Fi connectivity speed at this point, because we're in the cloud. So that's pulling it down from uh, 
the cloud onto your instance. Huh? Okay. Wow, okay. Okay, so the next thing, you have to make sure you're in slash mnt slash scratch for the next step. Uh, scratch zero, sorry. So make sure you cd to slash mnt slash scratch zero for the next step. I'm going back to the slides. Hopefully it will connect quickly. One at a time. Yeah, sure. Who put my IP address in that script? Your IP address? That's... Right. Uh, yeah, so I did that in the, in the startup script. So the startup script uh, actually pulls down metadata from, this, from what we talked about earlier. So the metadata has that external IP address. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I'm kind of run, worried about we're running out of time. Uh, so, okay. Let's just resize that window a little bit. So that line there that says XIP equals curl metadata network interfaces slash blah 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 slash external IP, that gets your external IP automatically when you yeah. when the startup script run. So basically I, I wanted to make it simple, otherwise you would have had to actually make a call to either a metadata server or to GCU to get instance to actually get your IP address. Uh, so I tried to make it simpler by doing some magic behind the scenes and putting that into the script. Uh, so that makes life a lot simpler, uh, but then it's used further on here to actually do that with the curl script, uh, the curl call. And that's what a startup script looks like. In this case, there's various stuff we've done. We've uh, simplified the login. We've actually pushed or set up the users. We've actually set up a user called GCE Code Lab XX, whatever the version you had. Uh, we've also uh, enabled password access and restarted SSH underscore config uh, to make that work. But we've done various other stuff to set up the environment. Going back to the slides very quickly, let's see if we can wrap this up. Yeah, so you can use you can use JSON underscore PP to actually pretty print that JSON file. So JSON underscore PP redirects the file into that, and it will pretty print the file for you. Uh, it gives you a list of URLs. Uh, they're all grouped by color, uh, and they have a relationship with each other. Uh, it's quite a complicated process to actually generate the image. And at the bottom there, it's got some metadata, which includes the name of the uh, <coughs> the name of the file that will be generated. I'm going to very quickly show you that. So you can see it. So JSON underscore PP with a redirect, tylersimon.json. And again, make sure you're in uh, slash MNT slash scratch zero. And that's the list of files that it's going to look at. And also some metadata at the bottom, uh, the actual coordinates we're looking at, and the na name of the file that it will produce. 41.png. Some people have obviously gone further ahead because 41 is not the first image. So the next step is to run one of the scripts we downloaded earlier called make coad cloud.py, and that's the command line string. Uh, you had that in the slides again. You downloaded. So Python, make coed cloud.py, tileassignment.json, which is the file that you downloaded earlier. And it's very important to include minus minus max images equals 15, otherwise you'll be here until this evening when the bar opens. The bar's open already, probably. <coughs> so make sure you specify minus minus max images equals 15, otherwise it could take quite a while. It's going to take three or four minutes anyway, uh, but I'm quite prepared to put up with that. So if you can run that and see how you go, and I'll do that myself. I 
I'll mark this one and I'll put the slides back. So basically what's that, what that's doing is actually analysing a bunch of files and it's kind of limiting the number of files it's going to look at, but it's looking for them to find regions that match with each other. Uh, it needs a key file for this to work correctly, uh, so it needs to find a key image that will actually be used by the rest of the system to actually align all the other images. Uh, if you limit to number 15 images, sometimes you don't always get that key image, uh, so it breaks. Uh, so if you do run, I've, I've actually tried to make sure there's at least 37 or so of these assignments that will work without going beyond 15 images. But really, you should be running without the minus, minus, max images, uh, and that will always work. But uh, with 15, it's a little bit more dubious, but you should be okay. But it just takes a little bit while to run, a little while to run. And it's downloading all of these 29 megabytes FITS files. And FITS files, if you want to look at the FITS file itself, it's in TMP, slash MNT, slash scratch zero, slash TMP. Uh, and it's got some uh, ASCII headers that provide information about the coordinates and such like for where the image came from. And it has some binary data at the end of it. How's everyone getting on? You've given up yet. <laughs> this is normally part of a larger code lab uh, that we do. We ran it for the first time at Google I.O. and we normally run it in two hours. But, so that kind of gives you some idea of uh, how long we would normally spend on this. I was hoping it would work pretty quickly. Yeah, you all have your own virtual machine. We have 60 available. So if there were 60 people in here, we could accommodate them. I could have created some more very easily, but we have 60 available. That's a couple of cores. So, so in this case, I decided to bump it up to four cores. Uh, so we have a four core one, just to make sure that it didn't take too long to do the processing. Uh, the processing is reasonably intensive in terms of CPU usage. Uh, but obviously, the big part of the actual process is actually downloading the files themselves. So uh, that's what's taking so long to actually run. Originally, we had one core instances. And I'll just say uh, that if you want to carry on, now you have the slides, if you want to carry on and, and try this afterwards, uh, finish off, if you don't get finished uh, during this session, then you can do it afterwards. Uh. Yep. Okay, so you got questions, anybody? More questions than answers, should be. Testing. Where's Steve going? So one thing I will say about uh, Computing Gene is that uh, we have credit packs for startups. So anybody who runs a startup and wants to get uh, started with Computing Gene, uh, Hopefully by next week we'll have credit packs that you can use, uh, we can give you uh, to get up and running. It's not free to use currently, at the moment you have to sign up and provide your credit card uh, to get started, but uh, as I say, next week we should have credit op offerings for startups to access Compute Engine. We have them already for App Engine. Taking too long. Well, that really depends what you want to do. If you want to build a cluster of a thousand instances, then uh, obviously that's going to cost you quite a bit. Uh, again, like Amazon, you only pay for instances that are running and for resources that are actually available and running. Uh, so it really depends on what your use case is. Just play, play, play around. I, don't, I can't give you any exact examples. Uh, Jimmy, do you think, can you think of any off your head? I, I would say just pull up the pricing webpage. It's actually reasonably cheap. I, I, I don't know the current you know, comparison to the recently changed Amazon prices of a couple of weeks ago, but it's, uh, it's very affordable to just play around, certainly on that price scale, yeah. So, okay, so well, thanks guys. Thanks for trying to follow along. Hopefully it, it would have taken less time uh, but we kind of got stuck. I expected to stay, but. 
No, no, you can carry on using it. You can carry on and finish if you want to. I'm not going to shut down the virtual machines for until later on this afternoon, so those virtual machines are still available. So you can just SSH into them and you'll be fine. And you get some Again, what, sorry? And you get some, some what, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we're not working again. There we go. So now we got a 15 minute break and then lunch. So uh, everybody give it up for Mary and her great, uh, excuse me, Mandy. I don't know why I called you Mary. I'm sorry. Mandy and her great demonstration here. Thank you, guys.